Thanks. Well, uh, welcome everybody. I'm, uh, my name is David Gellner and I'm the chair of the uh, Radhakrishnan um, Memorial Fund Committee. I'm standing in local Wooden uh, Hall Soul. And um, my pleasure to introduce today's speaker. This is actually the Radhakrishnan Lectures 2021, um, which for reasons that you can all guess were postponed. Uh, so actually this year we're going to we, we, embarrassment of riches, we're actually going to have two sets of uh, Next term, we will have Amitabha Viske, but this, this, this term we are really privileged to have Joya Chatterjee with us. Um, and I think she's probably actually very well known to all of you, so it's almost uh, OTH. But anyway, I'm going to introduce her anyway, for, just in case <laughs> you don't know who she is. Um, well, I think I'll take this off if you don't mind while I'm introducing her. So uh, her first monograph, Bengal Divided, I think it's, I mean, it's, lots of people have said, you know, this is actually the best book on Indian nationalism. It's certainly one of the most interesting analyses of that term. We hear so much, the, the Badra look. And uh, uh, one, one, one reviewer of it sort of pointedly remarked, few Badra look will take kindly to a Cambridge historian now telling them that it was their own parochialism, unattractive cultural chauvinism and virulent communalism that cost them a united Bengal. A second book, The Spoils of Partition, kind of continued that story uh, up to 1967, and it also attracted high praise for its meticulous scholarship, its literary style, and the refreshing revisionism of its conclusions. I'm not sure, I've not, I haven't asked her whether she'd be happy to be labelled as Cambridge School historian. Um, <laughs> but, uh, anyway, um, she certainly spent her career in Cambridge, and she's been director of the South Asia Centre in Cambridge. And of course, in Oxford, we were very jealous that, you know, we have all these South Asians, but we don't have a South Asia Centre. And from uh, 2009 to 2018, she was the editor of Modern Asian Studies, which in spite of its title, and in spite of the fact that it kind of does publish on other bits of Asia, is really the premier publication site for modern South Asian history. And she records that she read over 1,800 readers' reports on submissions during that time uh, as, as editor. And she's also had a big impact you know, on her work on Bengali migration, done with Anu Jalais and Claire Alexander, which led to the volume of Bengal Diaspora. And she's also a key person in the prize-winning website, Our Migration Story, which um, has resources on, it's not just about Bengal, it goes right back, has resources for teaching going right back to um, the year 43 of the Common Era. She was also the editor with David Washbrook of the Routledge Handbook of the South Asian diaspora, to which I contributed. And um, she's written in the introduction to her latest collection of essays, Partition's Legacies, Partition, Nation Making, Frontiers, Refugees, Minority Formation, the Categories of Citizenship have been my preoccupations. And I think, and I hope that all of those preoccupations are going to come together. But we're going to be starting today. And one little announcement. So today's is in person. But next week and the one after, they will all be entirely online. Thank you, David, um, for that very generous um, introduction and for reminding me about a book which continues to haunt me like an albatross. <laughs> um, but never mind. Uh, thank you for your generosity in, in inviting me to de deliver these in incredibly prestigious Radha Krishnan lectures. I feel humbled by the invitation, and I thank the warden um, and fellows of all souls for extending their hospitality to me. I'm also um, quite um, honored to be following in the footsteps of other, other great scholars who have been invited to uh, do these lectures. Most recently, A. Avzar Moin, whose work um, on Mughal and kinship has um, influenced my own thinking on this subject. One thing I bet even fellows of All Souls don't know is that Radhakrishnan was there at the midnight in question. That is to say, in the Indian Constituent Assembly between the 14th and 15th of August, 1947. Nehru gave him a brief to keep on talking don't stop talking until he himself, Nehru himself, stepped in at the stroke of the midnight hour when India awakes to life and freedom, and so on. 
to Radha Krishna Mukhi, he's talking till the 59th minute. I mean, this and this is typical of his life. He's he's there, but you don't see. He's an important but largely unsung figure of 20th century India. Perhaps someday, um, I'll give you a three a, week, a three a lecture series on the man himself, place uh, the place of his philosophy of Advaita Vedanta. Um, in the development of the most muscular Hindu modernism, which is so prevalent in our society today. But that's for another scholar altogether. Uh, here's just a few interesting facts about him that perhaps some of you know and some of you don't. don't. He was, of course, a Brahmin. Only a Brahmin could gain um, access to the Hindu metaphysical texts at the time. He was one of five sons and a daughter of in the Telugu-speaking areas of the Madras presidency. You will come across these regions in the course of this lecture. He himself reversed that balance in his own life by having five daughters and one son. Um, that boy would grow up to be the historian S. Gopal, who was also at Oxford and is best known for his biography of Nehru and also of British policy on India, British colonial policy in, of, in India. Radha Krishnan had many firsts to his name. He was the first Indian, and indeed, if I, my facts are right, I've checked carefully, he was the first Asian to hold a professorship at Oxford. He played a large part in the first language movement in independent India, in the Telugu Andhra Rail Sima region. He was India's first ambassador to the uh, Soviet Union, when he became a fan of Stalin, a great man of peace, he described him. He would have been India's first president if Nehru had, had his own way, but he didn't. Instead, he was its second. Not only was he a close friend and ally of Nehru's, he is rumoured to have shared Nehru's interest in women, consecutively, of course. Um, this rumour is not some sort of scurrilous gossip. We get it from uh, the, uh, Escobar, his son's own biography of his father. So the source, I think, is reliable. A complex man, a mixture of fine intellect, trusting ambition, and enjoyment of life's pleasures. Certainly, had he still been amongst us, I would have had visited uh, All Souls many a time to meet him for dinner and enjoy a good dressing down about how entirely I had missed the point about Advaita, about Vedanta, and everything else. I'm kidding, of course, but not wholly, as Vivekananda whose thesis of Vedanta so influenced Radha Krishnan will make a dramatic appearance in these lectures. So here I'm going to return to themes that have long been of interest to me, to which David has referred, the partition of 1947 and the flows of refugees. The historiography, uh, David, could you move it to slide two, please? The historiography concentrates on the mass migration crossing the Radcliffe line between India and Pakistan, famously photographed by Bok White and Cartier Bresson. When we think of the mass migrations after partition, the images conjured up immediately in our minds are those of the refugee caravans walking across the Waga border and the camps, so slides two, three, and uh, the next three, four, and five, please. These are the images that, you know, they come to our minds when we think of partition. We assume with the help of these images and these stories and this historic historiography that the frightened people who fled their homes faced a clear and binary choice between two distinct modern 
post-colonial sovereignties, India and Pakistan. This is the official narrative of the end of empire, British, Indian and Pakistani official history. Historians, including myself in my past work, have studied, who have studied partition refugees have stuck to the same old script. But today I'm going to shift our angle of vision from the international borders between India and Pakistan up to the different kind of internal borders around princely states. These and the migrations within and around them between 1947 and 1950 have been brushed into the dustbin of history. Nationalist frames have occluded them from view. It's been convenient for us all, the left-leaning establishment included, to denounce princes as though they were trapped in some different time warp of early modern history. To forget about the subjects of those states, to write out the history and the life worlds of the Riyaya, the Praja of the mid 20th century. One third of the people of the subcontinent, just like that. And assume that just by incorporation into a republic, they became liberal, rights-bearing citizens like you or me. Their inconvenient worldviews disappearing and changing overnight. As for the monarchs, they've had awful coverage, whether through the lens of British imperial attitudes or from colonial modernizers impatient with laggards from pre-modern times. The letters of British residents whose job it was to school their nabobs and keep them in line bristled with Orientalist attitudes that would have shocked Edward Said. Historians still insist, I mean, literally, I've been challenged on this um, last year in Cambridge. Historians still insist that they were feudal, as if Zamindari and Jagidari land revenue systems in the states, the principal states, were somehow more feudal, more medieval, more old school, and more oppressive than they were in British India. They were not. Feudal is not the word to describe the culture of kingship that persisted in India until 1947, and then lingered on in attenuated form until 1971, and even after then. This scholarship has begun to turn things around state by state, and consider what has now come to be understood as monarchical modernity. It's a theme I will return to next week. Of princes at midnight, nada. The notable exception in Sunil Purushottam's work on Hyderabad, no one has attempted to take a broad overview of all states, big and small, and look at what was happening in and around them, and, and then consider what it all meant. This series represents my attempt to piece together and understand the big picture. It's a huge and daunting task. I began it before the pandemic, before I had to retire for med medical reasons. So the picture I present here is not complete in any sense. It represents how far a lone historian, with some assistance, thank you Uttara Shahani and Sarfraz Hamid, um, Hamid, if you're listening, can take the history in her personal and these global circumstances. But even at this juncture, my research reveals a very different picture. One is both more infinitely more complex and more intriguing to the familiar one of, to, of partition and independence. You see, in 1947, hundreds of thousands of people made other choices regarding my migration, choices that did not involve the flight, flight to the other dominion. Instead, they migrated in small cities and large to princely states, in a preference that appears to indicate a lack of trust in both the new republics, they sought the protection of Rajas, Rani Sahibas, 
Rao Sahibs, Jam Sahibs, Nizams, Begums, and Nawabs. Just when the Constituent Assemblies of India and Pakistan were debating the terms of national citizenship, they fled in search of subjecthood. What follows is an attempt to piece together this history from fragmentary and scattered sources. This has been a difficult enterprise, as these movements were not tracked carefully as those of the refugees um, that were going into government-sponsored camps. In many cases, they were not tracked at all. I've therefore had to rely on impressionistic accounts, intelligence reports, odd letters from State Department files, work by independent scholars, and some very strange statistics in government white papers. But these fragments, when you put them together, and you layer them together, they create a shadowy picture that once glimpsed just cannot be forgotten. In the first part of this lecture series, I in today's lecture, I will discuss these patterns of migration and give you a sense of their scale and kind. In the next lecture, I'm going to try and tease out some of the ideas, hopes and expectations that animated them. These aspirations of post-imperial subjecthood failed, but a Whig interpretation of history cannot force them to be brushed under the carpet. They remain deeply significant in India in ways I hope to el elucidate in my concluding lecture. We need to move to the next slide. First, a word of background. Um, I'm sorry, many of you will know this stuff, but this is, this is just for those who um, have, have forgotten it or can't, uh, have never encountered it. In 1947, undivided India contained 562 princely states, which varied enormously in size. The largest was Hyderabad in the Deccan, which was half the size of France and boasted 17 million subjects in the mid 20th century. The smallest was less than one square mile with a population of barely 200. So it was glorified Zamindari. Together, they covered roughly a third of India's territory. Look at that. Look, if you look at the map, you can see the dark orange bits are the, are the princely states. That's the amount of land they covered and accounted for one in four of the population. You might ask, why is it one in four as, as opposed to one third? Well, many of the states were sp spread out in the desert tracts of um, the subcontinent and therefore supported a lower population. What I've tried to do for this lecture to make things more intelligible is divide the flows into four streams, um, because if I just described every single one, it would be too much. Um, so the first stream was a flight from the territories of former British India, now India or Pakistan, you know, newly divided along religious lines, new republics, of the subcontinent to princely states. So they're running from the Republic to a princely state. Prominent peninsular states ag acted as powerful magnets to panic-stricken Muslims from across India. Hyderabad and Bhopal are key examples. I'm going to talk about Bhopal in particular. Immediately after partition, refugees started pouring into Bho Bhopal which was an Afghan successor state established in the early 18th century. And then there's another one. Some of you may remember Bhopal for its ruling line of Begums, <coughs> who um, are very significant, as Barbara Metcalf has shown, for their contribution to Islamic theology. But in 1947, the man in the hot seat was um, Nawab Hamidullah of Bhopal. And he was the one who was actually having to face the refugee crisis that in engulfed his state. Obsessed as they were with rank, 
The British positioned Bhopal as second only to Hyderabad among the four, 562 states, but as you could see on the map, it's actually really rather smaller than uh, Hyderabad. Hamidullah had been recently the Chancellor of the Chamber of Princes, a rather dysfunctional lobby group which the Raja, Maharaja, as he called himself, of Patiala and other princes had created in the 1920s to defend their interests when it began to look as if their viceregal allies would dump them before too long, as they did. It was one of the, Patiala was one of the last princes to accede to India. The other laggards being Travancore, Hyderabad, Dholpur and Indore, and of course, I think as most people here will know, Kashmir. Please note, four of them were Hindu Rajas, or Sikh Rajas. It's not as though this is like a Hindu Muslim thing that Muslim Rajas are going in one direction and Hindu Rajas are going in another direction. Let's clear, get that idea um, quite um, like, let's, let's loosen that idea in our mind. Bhopal's prestige and position in VP Menon's jaundice view, VP Menon being the person who was responsible for the integration of princely states into India, were out of all proportion to the size and revenue of his state. In the hot August of 1947, frightened people saw it differently and clearly believed in the charismatic rule of the sovereign. Bhopal city was about 500 miles due south of Delhi. Um, there should be a map with showing the diff, the, yeah. You can see how Bhopal is situated in relation to Delhi and how far it is uh, respectively from Pakistan. Um, <laughs> immediately after Pakistan uh, independence and partition, thousands of Indian and Muslims from the central provinces, UP, Gwalior, e and East Pakistan made a beeline for it. Now note, these people chose to head south to Bhopal rather than migrate west or north to Pakistan which for many of the migrants was just as close or indeed closer. By mid-October, that's in the space of about a month and a half, 160,000 refugees had gathered in Bhopal city. And by this time, Bhopal city had become, become overwhelmed with the crisis. Um, the reason being also that the, in the previous year, there'd been a drought in the region, that central Indian region, and Bhopal, Bhopal was already kind of, had already got refugees from drought stricken areas and was still feeding and maintaining um, camps for uh, drought uh, refugees. And so therefore this was yet another uh, um, influx into the city. And it begins to, it begins to panic and it, uh, as it, and it asks the government of India, as it would have asked the British government, for some aid and assistance in helping these refugees, or paying for food, or asking for supplies of food to, uh, to feed these refugees. Now, it's quite interesting what the government of India replies. It basically says to, to the Hamidullah Bhopal, um, don't allow the don't allow these chaps to come into Bhopal. Uh, let them be leave them at the station. Now, the Bhopal station was about three miles outside Bhopal city, and so they order the because the railways were under the government of India's command. They order that nobody should be allowed to re leave the railway station property, and so you have now hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of thousands of people on Bhopal station platform, refusing to go anywhere out of Bhopal. And the situation becomes more and more desperate. They have no food, they're starving. Epidemic, uh, an epidemic breaks out 
And once again, um, Hamidullah writes to um, the refugee commissioner. Eventually, he writes to Nehru saying, look, this is the situation. We need to help these people. We can't just leave them at the station platform with nothing. And um, the, uh, uh, um, Patel replies, the home minister, and says, well, actually, what you need to do is get tough. And he advises the very same policies that the government of India was using vis-a-vis -vis refugees in its own camps, particularly in Bengal, which was to starve them out of the camps, i.e. deny them more than a week's rations. In this case, deny them even a day's rations. And then if they still did not leave the thing, leave the, leave the station pl platform, frog march them physically out of the station platform and throw them out of Hopal territory. So it was in this condition, in this weakened condition, that um, people, these people began to march towards Hyderabad. Now, again, let me remind you, Hyderabad is about 1,000 miles away from Bhopal. It's in the Deccan. It's as a kind of almost um, a mental shift, a person from the north, which Bhopal definitely was, was it represented some it represented a kind of um, Ganga Jamna Tazib or culture, which the crossing the Narbada and going south was, you know, it, it was it required them to think differently, but that's what they did. And these are people who are destitute, they're starving, they are sick, and so they come towards the Nawab's and Nizam's territories. And the Nizam is sympathetic to their plight, and he starts laying on transport to bring them to Hyderabad. Now the government of India starts getting very suspicious because it is very suspicious about Hyderabad's intentions, and it starts getting involved into a power play that would end in the tragedy of Operation Polo. Um, to say that the Indian government was suspicious of Hyderabad's intentions is an understatement. It did everything it could to prevent the movement of Muslim refugees from India, as well as from states of Bhopal into the Nizam's territories. But its attempts to stem these flows were ineffectual. Between August 1947 and September 1948, that is to say between partition and the police action or Operation Polo, that ended Hyderabad's independence, 750,000 <laughs> Indian Muslims had migrated to Hyderabad. But it's important to understand that refugees were not only attracted to these big important states, number one state, number two state, Hyderabad and Bhopal. Even more curiously, they rushed to the smallest of principal principalities and tikanas and a multitude of little kingdoms. David, could we just show us the slides of Atodi and Mala? Uh, yeah, that's just showing the Bhopal um, crisis. And if you move forward, you will see Patodi. Yeah? So, Patodi is a tiny little state just outside Delhi in present day Haryana. It consisted of about 40 villages. And in September 47, when the Delhi riots broke out, hundreds of thousands of refugees in uh, Patodi wrote, the Nawab, then Nawab of Patodi wrote, hundreds of thousands of refugees and wounded are, are pouring into Patodi town as the only place they feel safe. Now, it's interesting that the Nawab of Patodi wrote not to Nehru, but he wrote to the major general of the Indian army, a major general in the Indian army, who was from Nawanagar. He was a Jam Sahib from Nawanagar, um, Ranjit Singh, of the Ranjit Singhji family. And he said, they have lost faith in the Indian army. Can you do something to restore faith in the Indian army? Otherwise, they'll keep coming to us. 
and there's no trace of any reply to his letter. So Patodi becomes a huge center of um, migration. Mahmudabad, which is the next slide, is also a very minor state. It's a Shia state near Lucknow. I mean, these states are so small that if I were clever enough, which I'm not, I'm a total deet at these matters, if I tried to find them on Google Maps and insert that into a PowerPoint, I, I still wouldn't be able to show you them on the same, you know, show you them as real cities, as real places, because it, they're so they're so small. Then, like neighborhoods of Delhi, in their size. Um, but so Mahmudabad. Uh, also experienced this kind of influx of refugees and continues to harbor hundreds of thousands of refugees, including a huge influx of Sunnis into what had previously been a Shia state. And then we come to Maler Kotla. Now, Maler Kotla is very famous in the literature. It's another small Afghan state. Um, North India was dotted with these Afghan states, also known as Rohilla kingdoms. Uh, this one was established by the Sherwani dynasty, which Anna Bigelow has shown, and Pippa Vardy, who's in the audience, had done remarkable work to show it remained peaceful during partition. It was the destination for, for 40 to 60,000 refugees during the massacres in surrounding East Punjab. Now, Malakotla is not much more than a town with a little bit of territory around it. And it receives 40 to 60,000 refugees. It's got a branch of one of the Punjab rivers flowing through it. During the partition, it's just south of Patiala, which uh, experiences some of the worst um, um, violence directed against the Mayo community. And there are bodies flowing through Malar Kotla. Not a single Hindu or Sikh is killed. Not a single Muslim lo loses his life. And refugees flow into the city and overwhelm the city during that time. And there's complete peace. Complete peace reigns in Malarkotla uh, during the during the um, um, partition period. It was a multi-faith principality, as uh, Pippa and Anna Bigelow have shown. Bigelow's book, Sharing the Sacred, has been influential to this point that scholars have come to regard Malarkotla as a unique oasis of peace in a world shaken to its foundations by communal violence. It was, however, and this is my point here, by no means an exception. Bigelow also places heavy emphasis on an, the Malay Kotla's shared belief in a revered Muslim saint, the Sheikh, as an explanation for the communal amity. She is th thus unwittingly divided the sacred and political domains in a princely state. And in so doing, I believe she errs. The sacred, the sublime, and the more routine dimensions of political power were in these states very intricately um, interwoven. As Humera Iktidar has shown, secularization in its Western mode, which over time divides the sacred and profane spheres of power, has not proceeded in this way in South Asia or indeed many other parts of the world that are not Europe. I'll return to this important issue of, about the quality of sublime, sublime sovereignty as, the, as it existed in these states next week. Um, but I also want to make the point that it's not just the case that Muslims went to states that had Muslim rulers, although this was the dominant pattern. By 10th October 1947, there's a tiny state called Dhalpur, which some of you may have been if you've been on the golden scene or driven through. 
if you've driven through what's called the Golden Triangle these days. Um, Dhanpur had a deeply conservative Hindu Maharaja. Um, he was regarded as the most conservative Hindu Maharaja, and he was the bane of the state's ministry, as he simply wouldn't do as he was told um, by the British, uh, by his British resident. Um, by the time of, by about September 1947, again, it's close to Delhi, he, Dhalpur had already uh, received about 20,000 Muslim refugees. The Maharaja of Dhalpur then agreed to absorb even more refugees, extending uh, uh, an invitation to all the refugees at Bhopal station to come to Bhopal, uh, to come to Dhalpur. He's a Hindu Maharaja. He's saying, Bhopalis, from, you know, come from the station, come to my state, I'll accommodate you here. Um, the, an intelligence officer from the central government is watching all of this uh, with uh, dismay. And he send, sends a report. That I don't understand why this, this um, Dholpur has such a soft corner for these fellows, unquote. The Maharaja, for his part, defended his action in the name of our precious national Rajniti, which means politics or norms of politics, from our great cultures and outlooks. He also speaks about King Dharma, Raj Dharma. He says this requires him to um, safeguard and shelter destitutes regardless of their creed. So to summarize, we see people fleeing India and Pakistan in huge numbers and going to princely states, even though Pakistan was often as close, if not closer, at hand. This raises a paradox that I think we, we absolutely have to engage with. The second stream was of refugees who abandoned their home in one state and seek, to seek uh, shelter in another. In this quest, they often passed through Dominion territory, whether in India or in Pakistan, or sometimes in both, but carried on until they had reached the princely state of their choice. One example was the flight of Muslims from Ajmer, Bharatpur, and Alwar, uh, where communal violence, particularly against the people of the male community, reached horrific performance. I mean, we might call it ethnic cleansing. Um, and they went to states like Tonk, which are again, extremely, I mean, they're, they're really tiny. Tonk is another one of the Afghan states founded by a Pindari leader. It's, it's due south of Jaipur. And probably now it's more famous for being the um, birthplace of the uh, of the noted actor, the very fine actor Irfan Khan, who acted in Billu Barra and The Life of Pi and Makbul and um, the namesake, who died a few years ago. And Tonk is probably only known because Irfan Khan came from Tonk. It's it's so small; it's not even on the map. People don't go there, even though it has a beautiful fort. Um, by mid-November, this tiny little place had some 20,000, some 20,000 Muslims have already arrived there from Alwar and Bharatpur. Another is the unaccountable exodus of Muslims in large numbers, particularly weavers and artisans from the Holkar state of Indore, a Muslim, I mean, a Hindu ruled state, going to Hyderabad. A third was the case of Bhopal with the flight of 25,000 refugees from Gwalior, which, was, which had a Hindu Raja. The Maratha state of, uh, a Maratha state south of Agra and the Chambal River to Bhopal state. Now in this case, you see Muslim refugees who previously lived as subjects of a Hindu ruler, but now sought the protection of a Muslim Nawab or Nizam albeit in a Hindu majority state. So something weird is going on here too. They have the option of going and living in a Muslim majority dominion, 
Pakistan beckons. Or they could get the idea in their head that Pakistan beckons, even though by this time it was like, sorry, baby, prefer it if you didn't come. Um, but they are going to places which are Hindu majority areas, may have a Nawab at the top, like, I mean, um, Hyderabad was Hindu majority. Now, this is another form of immigration, which is really, very really interesting, which is, um, I call it migration to subjecthood. This involves crossing the Ratcliffe line between India and Pakistan, but instead of seeking the protection of the other dominion, going to neighboring principalities in the other state. Let me make this clear. This means not going to the camps established by the government of India and registering themselves as they were supposed to as refugees, but going directly to principalities and petitioning princesses or princes for succor. A major stream of the, this kind was of mainly Sindhi Hindu refugees from the Khan of Kalab in Balochistan to the Rajputana states in India. Another was the emigration of uh, refugees to Bawalpur, a largely barren district, a desert state on the left bank of the Indus. Now we know a fair amount about this migration to Bawalpur, which really throws some light on this. So Bawalpur is a sort of um, long, pretty arid state, and it's across, across the left bank of it's on the on the Indus. So. To get to Bahawalpur from India, um, or to the other way around, you have to cross the Sulaimanki headworks, which would be, become a major flashpoint in the tensions in the, what became the Indus uh, River dispute between India and Pakistan. So these refugees, they trudge to the uh, Sulaimanki headworks, and as they come into Pakistan territory, they are received by various Pakistan officials and uh, re rehabilitation officers who say this way to Pakistan, there's a kind of T-junction because of, of the river, um, this way to Pakistan, and they say, no, no, we're going that way to Bahawalpur. No, no, this way to Pakistan. No, no, that way to Bahawalpur. And they all start going to Bahawalpur in such, uh, um, in such a stream that uh, uh, Pendril Moon, who happened to have taken up an appointment uh, in the state months before partition, writes that his heart sank at the vast number of refugees, a column that stretched all the way from the McLeod Ganj Road, which was close to the Sulaimanki um, head um, works, to Bahawal Nagar, which was the capital of the state drawn mainly from Farozpur Tehsil in East Punjab. So they made a conscious choice. They knew what they were doing. They went in one direction rather than another. Another stream of this kind, but moving in the opposite direction, um, headed to Jodhpur state. Um, and these were mainly refugees from Hyderabad, Sindh. In fact, all the uh, Sin, uh, princely states bordering the western segment of the Radcliffe line faced a refugee crisis. Um, it, it, they received so many refugees. Now, I can't tell you the total figures because we just, there's no way of adding them up because not every state kept records as detailed as Bhopal did. Um, but we, there's a lot of panicky correspondence between the government of India and uh, the states, which gives you a sense of the, the, uh, the, the proportion. And I can just give you some kind of ethnographic, uh, anthropological um, uh, sense of what these places have, the extent to which these places have changed by the nature of the refugee influx. So. I happened to be going, um, this is, must be about 15, 20 years ago, with a colleague from the LSE who wanted to see the Golden Triangle. You know, to see India, time immemorial, forts, palaces and all this. 
So I thought, you know, great, I'll, I'll show you. So we planned a trip and we went to Jaipur and we went to uh, uh, Agra, Jaipur, Jaisalmer, Jodhpur, etc. And while in Jodhpur, we, as we went to the fort and did all that, looked at the Bahikatas and... Um, but I had been asked by a friend to get something from a shop, a particular shop. And this shop was not near the fort or any kind of tourist area, but I was told, you know, you go and you'll come to a choraha, means a, one of those gold uh, round, um, um, round roundabouts, basically. And so I ask people at the choraha, I'm looking for this shop, um, can you please guide me? Do you know where it is? So they said, well, in this direction there's the refugees, in that direction there's refugees, in this direction there are refugees, and in that direction there are refugees. So it must be in a refugee colony. So I was like, refugee colony? Four refugee colonies everywhere in the middle of Jodhpur? So I was really stunned because, of course, this was, I had no idea whatsoever that the whole population of Jodhpur, basically, are refugees. Um, and this is the extent of the change of the, of the population in these areas um, that has taken place. And we've, we've been blissfully unaware uh, of it. I mean, and I claim to be a historian of refugees. So I'm, I'm ashamed of myself in telling you that I uh, made these mistakes. The other story is of the Bahalpuris. This is a really interesting one. These are the Bahalpuris who want to come to India, yeah? not the ones who want to go to Pakistan. Now, Gandhi was really firm friends with the Nawab of Bahalpur, and he really firmly be believed in his um, will to maintain peace. So he's firefighting in the Punjab, Gandhi is. And he is urging Hindu and Sikh Bawalpuris not to leave Bawalpur, but to stay put. And they are getting more and more anxious. So Gandhi asked Sushila Nair, one of his aides, one of his women, um, close intimate friends, to go to Bawalpur and persuade them to stay. But um, she can't, and the, the flow begins. And um, they begin to migrate, and they come into India, and most of them disperse into princely states in the area, Jodhpur, Jaipur, uh, um, Jaisalmer, etc. But there's a bunch of 60,000 who somehow get pakraud or co caught by the, um, by the uh, official refugee camp people and who get put into cattle class, uh, those, those trains, and taken to Kurukshetra camp. Now, Kurukshetra is a central sort of clearing camp where all the refugees that had been gathered together from everywhere were sent for sorting. You know, this was the states, if you like, um, to use that horrible um, idea governmentality. Um, just, you know, let's get them all together, let's figure it out, let's make lists, let's send 20,000 here, 20,000 there. It was all about dispersal, you disperse the problem everywhere else. So what did they want to do about the Bawalpuris? They wanted to take these 60,000 people and disperse them 10,000, in lots of 10,000, to different places. You know, to Faridabad, to Muradabad, here, there, everywhere. The Bawalpuris resisted with all their might. They were not going to be, you know, disaggregated for one. And they were not going to go to Furidabad and Muradabad and X, but they were not going to go to the Indian Dominion. They were going to go to a state, and they decided upon this state. And that was Raipur. God knows why they chose Raipur. There must be a story there. I haven't uncovered it. Probably they had got 
a word from the, some of the other Bahawalpurs, Bahawalpurs in the state that there was land in Raipur because there was indeed much vacant land in, Bahawal, in Raipur. So what happens next? Now, because of Gandhi's investment in uh, Bhawalpur, after Gandhi's death, another one of Gandhi's intimate women friends, um, Alta Salam, who's again very unsung in history, barely known in history, um, she was one of the women with whom Gandhi experimented with celibacy. Um, she takes up the Bhawalpuri cause. And she goes and stays with them in Kurukshetra camp, and she resists their dispersal and so on and so forth. And when, you know, things start getting very hairy for them, she goes to Delhi. And she starts writing letters to everyone. Of course, she knows them all. She's Gandhi's inner circle. She knows every, every single official in charge of every single ministry. But she's unable to shift the decision that has been made to disperse the Bawal Puris. So what does she do? She does what you would expect a Gandhi to do. She goes on hunger strike outside Nehru's house, uh, one and only Nehru Memorial Museum and Library, where I got most of this material from. So um, she does that. And she starts day one, no food, no water, day two, no food, no water. She begins to weaken, Nehru coming in and out of the house, because then it was his house. Um, government officials, ministers coming in and out of the house. There's Altus Salam, whom they all know. And day three, that, you know, this goes on. Day four, this goes on. Day five, they cave in, they fold. And the Bahawal Puris get sent to um, Raipur. And there's panic. It, you know, the government goes into full on mode to not, you know, not only send them to Raipur, or assist them in going to Raipur, but in sending tents and whatever, you know, and doing whatever it can to make it seem as though this was their decision to send them to Raipur. But they got there in the end. I mean, this, this, these. People knew what they wanted. They were not doing this just as a sort of helter-skelter um, kind of action. Um, and then there's the case of Hyderabad, um, which is we possibly, if we could just see the slide of the Nizam, and then the slide of um, Hyderabad. This is a uh, rather more I mean, sort of story which allows you to see the nitty gritty of what was going on. We know more now about what, what happened inside Hyderabad um, after Operation Polo, um, which was the violent incorporation of Hyderabad into the Indian state because of the publication by Gafur Nurani of the Sundar Lal report of 1950 in full. This report has been suppressed by the government of India since its um, production, and it's now available for everybody to read. Um, um, and Sunil Purushottam has also done good work on the incorporation of Hyderabad by violence into the state. So, um, what is really interesting is that you've got this, you've got multiple flows going on. So you've got first this period of flow of 175,000 or so, say 200,000 Muslims flowing from various states to Hyderabad in the first months after partition. And you have a migration of some Hindus from Hyderabad to neighboring regions, but interestingly, the majority to princely states nearby. September comes, September 48 comes, and you have Razakar activity and um, 
and then the crushing of Razakar activity in about five or six districts of Hyderabad. And what we didn't realize really is the extent to which the um, Indian army unleashed a reign of terror in um, Hyderabad at that time. So that the Sundarlal Sundar only went to those five or six districts. It was meant to be a peace and goodwill mission by the government of India saying, you know, we love you all. But he arrives there and there's nobody there or people there are like in a daze. And um, he somehow goes from district to district and does some, cal you know, works out figures. And he calculates that about 40,000 Muslims had been killed in Operation Polo. And that indeed, uh, the Indian state had used Operation Polo as a, an excuse to crush the Telangana movement, which is a separate story altogether. But that's also part of what's going on at this time. Um, so at this point, you've got a really interesting um, phenomenon from, from these districts. Dave, could I just have movement? Um, the, another slide, it should be, yeah. At this point, you have something which at first confused me about, because he talks about lots of empty villages along the way and um, villages where there had been 10,000 people, 10,000 Muslims, only 3,000 remaining, villages where Muslims had migrated but they had migrated internally into Hyderabad. But they hadn't migrated to Hyderabad city. They'd migrated to places like this, which were to administrative centers, centers of, of power in Hyderabad, which they still imagined uh, um, some form of state authority rested in them. And they congregated in these districts around these sorts of sites. Um, none of them went to India. Um, they understood India. They knew what India was. They'd seen the face of the Indian army and uh, they didn't like it. Um, they, you know, they had survived the carnage they built new lives for themselves inside the state um, and other district centers. No written record have been, has been kept of them. I've not been able to find a single trace of any one of these people. But I can still hear the sound of their footsteps. There's a final point to bear in mind. Research on immobility has begun to change the field of migration studies. Whereas once immobility or stickiness, as I've described it, was believed to be caused by a lack of the capabilities and dispositions that enable migration, a new generation of historians is making the opposite point, that people are immobile because they want to be. Humaira Chaudhary, for instance, suggests they stay because they have many advantages to them in so doing, whether personal, religious, affective, or economic. This forces one to think afresh on all the state's populations who, like the people of Malay Kotla, watched in horror as partition engulfed the land, but stayed where they were and stood stock still taking in refugees wherever they could. They just stayed put in princely states and went nowhere. Should one include them in any calculus of how strong the ideals of princely subjecthood remains in, this, in the subcontinent? I think they should be talk, thought about very seriously. But today, because I've gone on for so long already, I don't, I'm not calculating them amongst all my streams. They did not, after all, vote with their feet. Um, I'm not. I'm not going to attempt to give you an aggregate 
I've often been asked, like, so how many of them were there? It's impossible to say. But uh, there's at least as many people um, moving internally as who crossed the Radcliffe line in one direction. I'm saying about seven and a half million people, at least, if you add up the state, that state, the other state, you know, you put them all together. Um, but it's not really about numbers that I'm interested. This lecture is not really about, oh, actually, these were more than the people who went across. It's about what they were doing and the fact that they were doing it at all and that we need to actually understand this and think about it. Um, so the really revealing figure is the Government of India's White Paper on States published in 1950. This suggests that trends, these trends of migration had been so widespread and so marked that the distribution of India's minorities had changed so dramatically within the three or two and a half years between 1947 and 1950, with a marked clustering of minorities in, in princely territories. By 1950, uh, India's Muslim population concentrated in princely territories had, had risen from 15% to 26%, and of Sikhs, 27% to 36%. And this is despite the fact that in their dispersal, their forced dispersals, many states had been forced to absorb Hindu majority refugees. So the actual demographic shift is much more significant than it appears to be. So I think it's really time that we begin to rethink what partition was. I think that we no longer can think about it using the ex example of, say, the exchange of population between Greek and Turkey in 1923 as some sort of some sort of comparative framework. It isn't like that. It's more like that too, but also some sort of maybe in Fakane in South Africa, where you've got people moving around in the face of different kinds of sovereignties occupying the same space, the similar region, and making different sorts of choices and creating a new kind of a new kind of um, ground reality. And that's uh, something which is worth taking very seriously and worth understanding if we are to understand anything at all about South a the South Asia that um, we've ended up um, being so interested in. That's all, thank you. <laughs>